as they get more into the intermediate level, um, I like to expand out a little bit. Um, what do you think of as intermediate? That's a good question. Um, I guess when I say elementary, if you're thinking in Suzuki Repertoire, which you're all familiar with, I would say sort of book one through three, early four. When I think of elementary, I think early elementary is kind of Vivaldi concertos. And then the upper, ele uh, I mean intermediate, early intermediate would be like Vivaldi concertos, and upper intermediate would be getting into Haydn, Viotti, Bach, A minor. And then advanced would be when they're hitting, uh, you know, Kapolesky, Mozart, Brooklaw, that kind of thing. And of course, there's no fine line on any of this. Um, so in, as they're beginning the intermediate levels and they're doing Vivaldi and, and these kinds of things, um, I'm still pretty much giving them fingerings and bowings in their pieces. I'm not giving them a lot of choice in the pieces that I'm assigning to them. We're not sitting there saying, well, bring back your Vivaldi next week and let me see how you did the Boeings. <laughs> you know, I'm still saying do this, do that, do it like this. But I do like to give them something. And in the, uh, our earlier, um, in the book four, there were those little lullabies um, in the book four. Um, and I used to have them do this process where they play, um, One week I would say, this is going to be an independent piece. We want you to bring it back to me next week. I'm not going to take you through it because I usually walk them through everything in the lesson. I don't just give them, say, learn this, bring it back next week. That's way later. I walk them through the bow distribution, the bow strokes, how to shift every, everything I walk through in the lesson so they know exactly how to physically analyze it. Um, but at that point, I'll say, okay, this is going to be an independent piece project. I want you to bring it to me next week. And for all in first position, just figure it out. And then anything you have trouble with, we'll talk about, but you can't ask your parents. <laughs> and so if they have trouble with rhythm, or if they have trouble with a note, or they play the wrong note, we'll talk about it in the lesson, and we'll work on it. Then the next week, I say, okay, now bring it back to me in third position. The next week, you have to play the whole thing in third position. And see you next week. And then bring it back in third position. And then the next week is, now I want you to make a combination version. <laughs> some of it in first position, some in third. You can shift wherever you want. Whatever you think sounds good, try different things and bring me your version. And we'll talk about it. And that's when we'll start talking about, you know, does it make sense to, like Marie was talking about, you know, to the... Does it make sense to go... We have those conversations at that time. So I like to start doing an independent piece project somewhere around book four, book five, where I give them a piece that's simpler than what we're working on, and I tell, and it has to be something not that they're not familiar with, and I say, go learn this on your own. Bring it back next week. And if you want to change any of the markings, go right ahead. You want to change a bowing, a fingering, go right ahead. We'll talk about it when you come back. <laughs> and in the summer at IU, I teach in the summers, I, I do this a lot with the older kids. I give them independent peace project, and sometimes we'll do a recital with no lesson. We'll just do <laughs> that they have to, we, uh, we do a, like a little kind of informal, but they all play for each other. They can rehearse with the pianist, but they cannot ask any teachers for help. And they have to do their own bowings and their own fingerings. I weighed out a lot of fingerings in the parts. And I find like weird, you know, you all have, I'm sure, thousands of collections of music that, with music pieces you've never taught, like Respighi Aria, for some reason, is a really good piece for this. It's in some collection I have. <laughs> Little Shostakovich pieces, you know, it can be short. And they have to then do a little recital with no lesson on the piece. And for a lot of them later, like years later, I'll talk to people who, who, who've done this with me in the summer, and they'll say, that was the best thing I ever did. That was like one of the most pivotal things they ever did in their learning process was perform something where they made all the decisions. And of course, some of them were scared, and some of the decisions weren't great, but you know, you, you at least can talk through that later and say, wow, that was a cool fingering you did, or you know, Here, here's an idea. Uh, so I'd like to start that around the intermediate level. Another thing I'll do often in certain pieces, if I feel like, you know, we all know there are pieces where there are options on fingering, I'll look for 
possibilities of like a phrase or two bars where I'll say, let's, you know, there are about, there are a number of ways we could do this, you know. I want you to try these three fingerings and uh, let's see how they sound. And I'll try three different fingerings and then we'll have that conversation. What do you think about those? Which one do you like? I like this one. Why? It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, well, you know, that's not a good reason. Let's talk about musically. Let's just pretend they're all easy. Musically, which one sounds better? What about the sound? You know, what about the sound? Do you like that sound on that note or that sound on that note? Do you like the open E there or not the open E there? It could go either way, and I try to be very, you know, I, I'm open. I really, these are all acceptable fingerings. You know, let's figure out which one. Well, I like this one, but the shift is hard. Well, let's work on the shift. <laughs> you know, let's practice that. So I try to give, find some places where they have some options so that they're learning how to think about it. It's again awareness. I have met some kids actually who, who are, feel so independently sure that somewhere along the line, somebody gave them a lot of power over making their choices. They're so sure that this is the fingering I want to do because <laughs> I like it, um, that they're actually not open-minded to, to other things. And I think you have to watch out for that too. You have to watch out for that too, that you don't so much tell your student, you know, you can interpret this any way you want. You can do any fingering you want, because it's not true. <laughs> you know, a, a good musician can't just use just any fingering, and, and you can't just interpret it any way you want. You have to look at the music and see what the music says. You can't just throw stuff in there, always, that a composer didn't, didn't, didn't put in there. I mean, sometimes you can, maybe, but, you know, so you have to walk that fine line and, and help them understand it's a process of, of choices. Um, bow wings, I'll just do the same thing. Let's hook these, what do you think? What, well, do you want to be down bow? Where do you want to be down bow? Let's reverse engineer it. Let's try different bow wings. So basically what I'm talking about is, is helping them learn how to think about making these choices. But you're not going to be able to do this for a whole entire piece at every lesson. It would take way too long. So fundamentally, I'm giving them my fingers and bowings. And then in the lesson, we'll have a few places where we, we, we talk about options, because um, it would take way, way too long. Now, earlier this morning, I did with one of the young ladies a little bit thing, this three bears thing. <laughs> that sounds really stupid, but it's actually really working for a lot of my students in terms of they're starting to get the idea themselves. This is kind of new. Um, and this is this idea, again, taken uh, from the earlier part when I said, you know, you want to help them with balance and flexibility and physicality and comfort with their instrument. And when they're younger, you're kind of just saying, do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, at a certain point, I'm going to get a little more complex with that and having them experiment with the different, with the different options. So this morning, we were doing, um, like, is your elbow, you know, your elbow's too high, you know, your elbow's too low. Uh, that feels about right. You know, you want to bounce. I find bouncing is helpful because it gets the um, sensation of weight. I'm looking for the elbow to be about where the screw is, but for some kids, if you say, you know, put your elbow about where the screw is, first of all, they can't see it in the same frame that you can, and they don't get it. Some of them do. So eventually, it's sensory. You know, it's sensory. So that's a press pressing. You want to relax that arm. And just let the bow float. And if it's too far under, then you're getting your sound from your hand. That's not good. I always tell them we need tickle space under both of our armpits. <laughs> <laughs> really, sometimes you know if they're going like this, and they're coming. I can't tickle you. <laughs> you know, so you have to have a little bit of wings, a little bit of wings there. Um, with the left hand, if they're having trouble with that, I'll say, okay, well, let's put the too far your wrist too far in. Can you play like that? Oh, that's difficult, actually. Okay, put your wrist way far out. Oh, I can't reach my four. Okay, well, this is why we have to find the balance. Our wrist is going to be sort of straight, maybe a little in, but definitely not in here, because why? Because your fingers can't drop, and why not here? Because you can't reach your four. So let's just wiggle it. So I'll have them play. Play with way out. Which is how you know, some kids play. Play. And then play. And wiggle it. 
Does that feel about right? Yeah, that looks better. Um, with the um, bow hold, we'll do the same thing. We're talking about pronation and supination. And at this, with an immediate level kit, I'll introduce those terms. And I'll say, okay, well, let's play really pronated, like you're really, really leaning on your first finger. Oh, that doesn't sound good because you're just pressing. Let's go the other way. Turn, it's like turning a doorknob. Pronation and supination is actually a rotation of the forearm. Um, so I'll say, turn your doorknob to the right, <laughs> and then you're leaning on your pinky. Now play. Oh, well, that also sounds kind of weak, doesn't it? So let's try to figure out where in the middle. And what's really helpful is to do it while you play. So let's say we'll start with two pronated. And we're going to change while we play. It's actually hard to do. Mm -hmm. And then you go, ah, oh, that feels good. OK, I'm going to do it again. Oh, too far. That feels pretty good. Too far. That feels pretty good. And you notice that your comfort level goes with the sound. That when you're not comfortable, this it doesn't sound so good either. When you're not comfortable this way, it doesn't sound so good. And when you get in the middle, it sounds better. Now, in order to do that, you have to have a flexible thumb. And most kids don't, you know, it takes years to develop a flexible thumb. But sometimes, just when you think they can't do that, it's when you should have them do it. Because that exercise forces their thumb to move. So even if they can't really do a smooth bow, which they probably won't be able to the first time, just the fact of that experimentation will get them outside of what they're stuck in and get them feeling different things. And that could be helpful. It's very helpful with spiccato. So if you have a student playing spiccato and it's tight here, just have them try doing the spiccato and change. good and then the sound opens up when it is more balanced. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite things about balance, uh, um, things to think about with balance is um, a tightrope walker. So sometimes I'll say to them, you know, we're just balancing our bow at the frog, you know, our, our bow is just balancing, our head is balancing here, our body is balanced, you know, what does that mean? You know, it's kind of an ethereal term. And so I often tell them, imagine that you are on one of those tightrope walker guys, you know, over Niagara Falls. And you're really trying, you know, not to die. <laughs> but you're trying to just um, stay on that rope. And the thing about balance is you can't make yourself be that way. It's like life, I guess. You can't, you can't make yourself be balanced. You can't go, okay, I'm going to make myself be balanced, because then you're gone. You have to allow yourself to be balanced. You have to figure out, you have to allow your body to find it. You can't make it happen. And, and so that's why I think so much about this is you can't say, curve that pinky and get your fingers here and do this, you know, and hold your bow like this in a way that makes them tight because then it can't be balanced. So I, I sometimes I will give on exactly how it looks if I had to pick <laughs> between being tight and looking really good and being a little floppy and maybe looking a little out of sorts. I would go with floppy in my earlier levels any day of the week. Because if you're flexible, you can adjust later and you can learn to, to bring in a little bit more form. But if you're really tight, it's, it's my, it takes years to undo that, especially in the thumb, and then the just basic grab, that basic sensory um, approach to coming to the instrument in a relaxed way as opposed to, you know, like this. So I think with younger kids, are not going to get all that. With a little bit in, there in the teen and preteen, you can start talking about tight ropes and balance in, in a little bit... Um, more clear way with them and, and they can start to they can start to understand that um, with the three bears you can do it with anything you know with contact point you know here you know you can do it with pressure bow speed you can do it with anything you want 
But I have found that um, some of my students are starting to um, experiment with it, understand the experimentation of the physical, the relationship of the physical to the oral. If it feels good, it's going to sound good. If it feels tight, it's going to sound tight. And that takes, that takes years. Um, in the intermediate stage, I still do a ton of repetitions in the lesson. Um, their music is getting more difficult, there's more shifting. So when they're playing um, a piece that has, you know, shifting notes, we'll go through every shifting note um, in the first lesson of the piece so that they understand how they're getting from note to note. So, you know, like a blunt kid the other day, you were there. I'll hear it like that for weeks before I take those shifting notes out to make sure that the arm is moving, the thumb is good, it's in tune, they know the whole what's going on. I wait for a very long time before I even hear it in the lesson without the shifting note. I wait until it's there and, and understood in the hand. Um, so a lot of intermediate level practicing is shifting because much of what's out of tune is about shifting. <laughs> and so that's where I spend a lot of time in the lesson uh, with the physical work. You know, a lot of kids can practice learn notes on their own at this stage. You're hoping that they can go home and they can read etudes and they can read notes and they can learn pieces and they can, you know, do this kind of stuff. And the quicker they are at doing that, of course it's great because then they can come into the next lesson and they have a whole bunch of things prepared. What I usually find though is that it takes a really long time before students really care about these sensory things and you know adjusting their bow hold and that sensory stuff it takes a much more mature student before they care about that in the lessons. And so for the student who's practicing a lot and comes in prepared, I'll spend even more time with the physical stuff because I know they've got the piece but you know, I'm spending time making it sound beautiful. You know, make it, making it sound beautiful. And you hope then that by that work, they're gonna go home and they want to sound as good as they just sounded in their lesson. You have to send them off sounding better than they did when they walked in the door. Because then they feed off that. That's what you want them to remember. Um, that's what you want them to remember. Um, now, the next thing is about layered practice. And I start doing this more in the intermediate level. And um, sometimes I call this the Ten Commandments. And I took this from actually a famous teacher in Holland who I worked with for many summers, uh, Kosha Wiesendek, who was um, actually her student who came to IU for many years, is now pretty hot, um, Janine Jensen. Mm -hmm. Right. So Kosha was Janine's teacher from the beginning through, you know, eight, you know 17 or 18. And Kosha's a fascinating, fascinating teacher. She's, she hasn't been in this country for quite a while. But I learned a lot watching her teach. And she's very into independent thinking from the very beginning. Almost, to me, it was like almost too far on that level. I mean, if you take spoon feeding as one side and, you know, just go figure it out for yourself as the other, she's definitely on that side. <laughs> but one thing I loved was her, I, her uh, structure for layering their practice and how she would hear it in the lessons to develop independence. So she had 10, and I don't even know if this is the right order. You can do what you want. But the first thing, number one, is correct notes. And I add fingerings to that. And when I say correct, I'm just saying, you know, good fingerings. You, you know, obviously there's discussion there depending on the student, blah, 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 you know what I mean. Um, second is correct rhythms. Third one is bowings. Fourth one is intonation. And this doesn't mean that they're not going to care about their intonation until they get to this point, obviously, but we'll talk about that. Fifth one, I added bow distribution. Sixth one, bow strokes and articulation. Seventh one, shifting. Amen. Amen. Five was bow distribution. Six was bow strokes. Articulation, you could put that in there. I split those up actually. She had that all together, but I, I kind of find it helpful to split it. Uh, seven is shifting. Eight is vibrato. Nine is phrasing. And ten is character dynamics, 
view the content and all of that. Now, you have to be very careful how you look at this, okay, as to not misinterpret it. Because <laughs> this could be very easily misinterpreted. <laughs> like, don't think about the music until you can get everything out. And that is not the intent. Okay. The idea of this is to help a developing student know that there are many different aspects to learning a piece. And that when you practice, you, you, have, you do best in your practice if you focus on one thing at a time in your earlier years of practicing. Eventually, with your more advanced students, you get to a much more holistic kind of practice where you just listen and go, oh, that doesn't sound right, I'm going to adjust my right arm, I don't like that sound, I'm going to vibrate faster, that was out of tune, I'm going to redo that shift. You know, and you, you have this whole arsenal of things anyway, and you can just make your adjustments, whether it's conscious, for most of us, or some conscious for some people, maybe. Um, it's eventually you're going to get to a more holistic practice. But it takes years to get to that. And most of our even very gifted students are not good practicers um, yet. You know, it takes a lot. So an example of a lesson I watched with her, um, a student came in and played an entire Lenarski Mazurka. And it was obviously early in the process. And she listened to the whole piece straight through. There are all kinds of things wrong with it. And me, I would have stopped after the first bar and started fixing things. <laughs> you know, so it was already like really different for me. Um, but I, I was in the I'm observing, listening, learning mode. And um, at the end of the lesson, or after he played it, she said, um, did you play all the right notes? And he said, Actually, I'm not sure about this one place. I think I, I think I did something wrong. And she goes, next week I'll hear it with all the right notes. Mm -hmm. Next, <laughs> she went up to the A dude. That was it. Wow. And then the next week I watched this kid. The next week, you played all the right notes. Did you play all the right rhythms? I don't think so. Next week I'll hear it with all the right rhythms. <laughs> and next A dude, whatever. And me, I'm like dying, because you know, I would have just found, okay, let's clap this rhythm, let's do this. So we talked about this, of course, you know. I was living with her and I picked her brain. And, and what she said was fascinating to me. She said, well, he's my student at home, I know him. And there's a difference. She said, if I really thought he didn't understand the rhythms, I would have helped him with the rhythms. But he's 13 and we've worked on counting and he knows how to do it, he's lazy. And I'm not going to waste my time. And that was the answer. The answer, and, and that I, I've thought so much about that over the years. Uh, because I think my tendency is go in there and help them whether they need it or not. <laughs> you know? And, and, and her answer was great, which was, as a teacher, I think we have to figure out the difference between whether they don't understand it in which case you can't yell at them, kick them out, and everything else. If they can't hear it's out of tune, if they don't know how, they don't know the rhythms, they don't know how to figure it out yet, it's our job to sit there and help them figure it out. But if you know they can count and you know they can do it, and they're just being lazy, by her doing that, she's ensuring that he's gonna go back and work on his time. And what her point was, it, it's painful for a while, but it speeds up the process of their independence and they walk into the lesson with a higher level of preparedness if they know you're not going to, you know, listen to that. And, um, and so it's also, I think, was a way for her to help them structure their, their practicing. And so I've kind of used this some, with some of my students as a way of helping me remember if a student comes in and there are a couple wrong notes and the rhythms aren't quite right, but it basically sounds musical and good, and, and all of this, at a certain point I have to say to myself, you know what, we, we, we can't just start talking about profundities, you know, profound musical insights. You know, you can't play with the wrong note. You can't play with the wrong rhythm. It has to be in tune, you know. Um, maybe another week you're gonna focus on bow distribution and get it more clarified. Maybe the direction is good, the distribution isn't great. Maybe the distribution is great, but you're working on collet, and you want to say, this week we're going to work on all the spiccato places, or all the collet. 
maybe it's sounding great and fabulous, and now you're saying, you know, let's see if your vibrato is really matching your sound. Let's work on your vibrato for a more sophisticated student. Let's spend a week on vibrato on this piece. And of course, really, you're working on all of this all the time. And they're getting to know, just remember that they're getting to know the music as they get to know the piece. And so that's one reason why you can talk about the music at the beginning, of course, and talk about the phrasing and the phrase structure, but you're going to go more deeply into that as they're able to technically be able to play it. <laughs> so they're learning the music as they learn the piece. Um, uh, another great way to think about organizing practice is um, I have a friend and colleague, Sherry Sinop, who teaches at the University of Wyoming. And I love the way she organizes this. She says to, to her students, you have to do a musical analysis of your piece and a technical analysis. So the musical analysis would be for Kin and Book One, this is ABA. <laughs> it's in D major, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is a minuet. <laughs> and for somebody else, it's gonna be, this is not an allegro form, and we're moving to the dominant, and, and you know, X, Y, or Z. And for a more sophisticated student, you know, it gets more sophisticated. But you have some kind of formal structural understanding, you know your key, you know the main harmonic points, um, you're looking at, is this a four bar phrase? Is it an eight bar phrase? Where's the line of the phrase? Where are we heading? Why is that note heavy? All these kinds of musical things. Then your technical analysis, how am I gonna actually like make this music come out? And that's where you decide your fingerings. You make your bow, dis your bow distribution based on that, your fingerings based on that. And, um, and you're, you're um, you know, using your skills to bring out the music, which is eventually what you want. I do think a lot of times with intermediate level students, we're still talking very technically um, in, in terms of skill sets and, and do it like this, do it like this, and maybe not enough about the music itself. So I think as it's important to remember to be talking about singing about uh, the music from the beginning. And as they get more advanced, I find that to be a more motivational aspect for them. So if you think about, and I see these young kids here just laughing. <laughs> we can ask them what they think. <laughs> but if you think about a young child who's just ready for their lesson, and you're telling them to curve their pinky, and they're listening to you, and they're trying, and their mom's helping them at home, and they're really trying to do it. Then you're working with, excuse me, all you teenagers, then you're working with a 14-year-old who plays like this, who really could care less how they hold their bow, you know? And you know that when they go home, they're not going, oh, gee, this just doesn't feel quite right. I just, I mean, you know, fly in the well, we know better, right? Um, you know, then, you know, the question is, do I scream at them and, you know, beat them over the head every lesson for 20 years to, to try to change that bow hold? What am I, what am I going to do about this? Or, my goodness, I've been working with them for five years. How, how could one of my students end up holding their bow like that, you know? I think we've all had that feeling. But in the end, you know, they, they, it's up to them in the end. It really is. It's up to them in the end. If they want to sound good, um, it's up to them. So I usually, um, and you should turn off the video while I say this, but sometimes I just let some of that go for a while. Uh, so I, I think it's psychological. It depends on the student. You have to look at what's motivating them at a certain age and what's keeping them playing and where, what their own personal relationship is with music and the violin to make the choice about how much you're going to um, you know, push that point, shall we say. And sometimes if I feel like they're just not getting, uh, getting any progress in a certain area, um, and I've tried everything, maybe they're just not ready for that right now. Maybe they're not aware, it's, a, it's another awareness thing. They may not be aware. I had a student who had the tightest vibrato. She played up and down the violin and her sound was god awful. Just tight, tight, tight vibrato. I worked on it every week, every week, wiggling those fingers, all the time, all the time, all the time. I finally just said, okay, I'm just gonna let this go for a while. We did other things. She went to a summer camp, she, or to an orchestra rehearsal. She came back and she said, you know, I was watching my friend and their vibrato was wider than mine. Nothing to do with me. 
she acted like she'd never heard it from me in her life. <laughs> And I just learned a big lesson from that. And I think it's a, I think it's just human nature. I think it's okay. I think there are just times you have to let things go. And, and sometimes they'll come back to it when they want to. But what, what I like to do at this age, though, is try to come at things maybe a little more music first. So instead of coming, okay, we're going to put our bow here and do this bow distribution and everything, which I'm so big on when they're little. You know, let's look at this piece. This is romantic. What kind of sound do you want? Play that first phrase. Do you like that sound? You know, well, me. Well, I want it to sound bigger. Well, you know, what do you think you could do for it? <laughs> you know, is there anything about your right arm? You know, oh, well, maybe I could do this. And you be, you know, I think you have to turn it around and ask, start asking more questions, asking them what they hear, what they want to hear, what they like about the violin, what kind of music they like, what they'd like to play, what, how they want to improve. Um, so, I mean, I can look at any student and say, okay, you know, I feel like this semester we should work on this, 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 and this. And I used to kind of project that on them, you know, this is my plan for you. And I've learned over the years as they get older, I do the opposite. When the, when the semester starts, I say, Howard, what do you see for yourself with the violin or viola this, this semester? You know, what, how do you want to improve? In what way do you want to improve? Are there any pieces you're dying to play? Even if it's like really far off, just tell me something. What kind of music do you like? What, what's on your What's on your iPod? <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> yeah, you may not want to know. But you know, I mean, I I mean, I've had kids before where I'm thinking, oh wow, I would just so like to work on this. And I ask one student who's kind of shy and just quiet, what would you like to do? I want to learn how to play fast. <laughs> Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right then. And and so sometimes I think with as they move into those preteen, early teen areas, it's critical that you're tapping into something that they're passionate about. They're getting passionate themselves. They're getting ideas, they're getting opinions, and they're starting to bump against their parents. And you want to be sure that you're not lumped in with the parents. You, you want to be the the the. <laughs> you don't want to be lumped in with their their you know um, rebelling against you. You want to be the the place that they feel safe to you know say what they really feel and really you know do something with all this energy that's going on. So I love this age, actually. I love the age. I love when they start talking back a little bit and asking questions. I don't like that fingering, you know, or, or whatever it is. I don't want to play this piece. It's so boring. Everybody plays this. I don't want to play it. You know, I mean, if you, if you open up the line of communication with them and get them to talk with you and be honest, and sometimes, you know, some of them won't, won't but a little bit, you'll learn more about them and, you'll, and it may change your plans for them. I've changed my repertoire ideas for a student on the spot, you know, because I spend time every summer, you know, making a whole A-tune repertoire list for all my students for the coming year, and by the end of the first week, it's completely different. And, and I mean, that's okay. That's okay, because I think you have to wiggle a little bit to where their, where their sensibility is.